good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see so many of you joining us today. Uh, I'm Susanna Warren. I'm the director of music and member events at the Arts Club. So uh, welcome to today's online webinar titled, We've Got Your Back. Um, we imagine that many of you are working in new home offices, um, which might mean compromising your posture without the correct setup and chairs at home. Um, so if you are experiencing any physical discomfort or would like to stop any in its tracks, um, today our Lanzerhof at the Arts Club Practitioners are here to help. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sebastian Kuntz, Medical Director and Consultant Orthopaedic and Trauma Surgeon and uh, Dr. Neil Aguera, physiotherapist and chiropractor, as they discuss the main causes of lower back pain and the simple exercises and activities that can reduce it. Both uh, Dr. Sebastian and Dr. Neil have worked with elite athletes, actors, uh, performance artists who demand the highest levels of expertise and they are the very best at relieving pain, aiding recovery and um, restoring peak performance. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout the course of the talk, please do type them into the Q&A box and um, Dr. Sebastian and Dr. Neil will answer as many of them as possible at the end. And uh, I'll now, now hand you over to Dr. Sebastian and Dr. Neil. Yeah, thank you, Susanna, uh, for the introduction, for the very kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope you all are safe and, uh, uh, and healthy during this uh, difficult time. Yes, we want to talk about today uh, about the back and, uh, and what you can do in this, in this time when you are sitting all the time. And we, we went all back to home office. And so we want to talk a bit about um, the background in general. So we talk a bit, of, it's a bit of theory. And then we talk about causes, what can lead to back pain and what's very important to consider. But then we want to make it also uh, very practical because we, we do some, uh, we show you some self-test and self-assessment and give you practical tips how you can um, uh, work in terms of exercises and as well as how to set up the working space. So before we go into, into the practical um, uh, side of things, I think it's very important to understand the spine in general. So on the right hand side, you see a whole body MRI of the, of the whole spine. And then you see how our, our spine is structured. Most of you might know it. So we have the lumbar spine, we have the thoracic spine, which you can see here and the cervical spine. And at the end of the day, it's very important to understand that we have a double S curve. So we have a, a, a lordosis, which we call it in the lumbar spine a kyphosis in the thoracic spine and in the cervical spine, uh, also a lordosis. And that's very important when it comes to exercises to understand that. If we go a bit more into detail, see on the left-hand side, you see an MRI in the lateral view. We see it, uh, say it as a sagittal plane. You see when you follow my cursor and you can see the cursor here, you see that the, these are the virtual bodies in this case, the lumbar spine. Some, some of you might have heard L5, S1, L4, L5. So you understand that's on this level. And in between here, the virtual bodies, we found the discs. And, uh, and uh, this is very important to understand when it comes to uh, a disc bulge, disc herniation, to know uh, how this looks like in terms of a normal anatomy. And I'm going to show you uh, very soon how it looks when it's uh, the pathology. If we go then a route of an actual plane, means this is an MRI, uh, we call it the transversal plane. So you see here, this is the vertebral body, body to understand. If we look, A is anterior, so it's, it's the front of your body, and uh, P is posterior, so it's the back of your body, and uh, right and left. So you see here is the vertebral body, and on top of it would be the disc, and here's the spinous processes or uh, a spinous uh, process which is here in the back, which you, which you can feel and you can touch it on your own. And two things I would like to highlight here on this picture is one thing is the facet joints. Uh, the facet joints allow us to move, which is a very, very important function of the spine. And uh, the spinal cord, uh, meaning here the cauda equina, the fiber of the, of the spinal cord, 
leave here the spinal canal and, uh, and um, the foramen uh, can be compressed by a herniated disc. So what are the main functions? I mean, there are so many functions of the, of the, of the spine. Uh, we just wanted to highlight um, uh, one or two. Of course, it protects the spinal cord, uh, but most important is that when it comes to exercise, that the spine allows us to move in all three planes uh, uh, because of our facet joints. Um, what can cause back pain? There are many, many reasons uh, which can cause back pain. Um, and I want to show you uh, the two main, main things which we find in MRI, again on the left-hand side, from the side, a normal MRI, and here on the right-hand side, several pathologies in terms of the disc. If you look at A, B, and C, you find the disc here in between, and you find here mild disc degeneration, which you can see that the height is here reduced. And when it comes to a severe disc degeneration, the height is, is significantly reduced, the height of the hernia of the, of the disc. And on the right side here, D, E, and F, you see different sizes of, uh, of disc prolapse, disc bulging, herniation. Uh, it's here on D, it's a mild one. And as if you see here on E, it's a significant disc extrusion, which can also lead to a migration. And this is definitely something which is a severe problem. Uh, same thing when we look again in the actual plane, again here on the left side, this is the normal uh, anatomy. And on the right hand side, you can clearly see that this, this space doesn't belong here. So this is disc material. And this clearly compresses here uh, the nerves which will leave here the, the foramen. And this, for instance, is very important to understand also in terms of self-assessment. Uh, these are acute and severe problems. And you will see that and you will realize that uh, in terms of weakness. So if you exper experience any weakness in your muscles, and Neil will go through some self-tests and self-assessments, that is an acute situation, it's an emergency, can be an emergency, and that's where you have to call your consultant or your doctor to, to get this checked. Another thing which is very important is also emergency. So if you experience any urinary or bowel incontinence, things like this, that is an absolute emergency. So you need to call the consultant uh, right away. So this needs to be solved. Uh, another pathology, and when it comes to exercising and allowing us to move in all three planes is the so-called facet joints. Again, on the left-hand side, you see the normal anatomy. And on the right-hand side, you clearly can see here that there is a lot of, of white area inside the joint, which means that there is an effusion, joint effusion in the joint. This can cause pain. And uh, typically, this makes more local pain, more, more local deep lumbar spine pain, while the herniated disc causes beside lumbar spine pain uh, also some sort of leg pain. Uh, in many cases, it, uh, it's, it, or it's, it's in many cases um, the case that we have uh, an MRI, but uh, the clinical uh, presentation is completely uh, different. So there is no clear correlation between the MRI on the one hand side and the clinical symptoms on the other hand side. And then it's the question, why, what can cause uh, the problem? And then, and then we have to uh, take also the function in, in consideration. And whatever is related to function is also a muscle-related fascia related or even some sort of limitation in range of motion in the joint plane. The question is when we talk about function and you can see here three images of a, of a unique machine which we have in Lanzo Vetti Arts Club. Uh, it's a machine where we can really assess the deeper core and as you can see uh, I, I always test machines on my, on my own to see what, what, what we have to do or what we do with our patients. Um, this is also because I, I was an elite athlete when I was young and uh, due to many injuries, I had to stop my, my football career and one of my injuries was, uh, was back pain. So I had with 15 years old, uh, when I was 15 years old, I had uh, a herniated disc, so very young actually. And uh, what I was told when I was young, we're talking in the early 90s, uh, okay, that's uh, due to your weakness, genetics. 
but I couldn't believe uh, uh, the Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest. So that's why I, I looked more and more into it. And, and that led uh, definitely to a situation where you have to take the function into consideration. And when I talk to, about function, then we can talk about many things, but I like to structure it for you in a way that you uh, can better understand it. So we have to understand function belongs. We have to assess the posture. So we can do this with the machine on the right hand side. So it's a stereorastrography. Stero so we're without radiation, we can uh, measure the function in the static conditions, but also during dynamic tasks such as uh, walking. Um, of course, it's very important when we talk about muscles, not only from a manual perspective, tension and so on, but also from a mechanical perspective to assess the strengths and the flexibility. And when we talk about strengths, we can assess the global strengths. And it's always important to do that in 3D, like in all three planes. And um, it's also important to take the core into, into consideration. And here you see the machine where you saw me before. Another two uh, or two um, another po important points are the neuromuscular perspective. Uh, when we talk about neuromuscular perspective, we talk about measuring muscle activity. We can do that with an EMG, EMG system, which you see here on the left left hand side on the bottom. So you see here, for instance, when it comes to neck pain, you can place an EMG on the muscle here, on the upper trapezius muscle, the neck muscle. And while you're typing, for instance, on, a, on your keyboard, you can see the activity on the, on the muscles. So, and most of us, we're typing like this, we're under stress and so on. So we can measure that to see if you are, um, have a more or less normal um, situation in your muscle activity, or if it's too much and the activity is too high. And lastly, um, it's also very important to assess, assess dynamic tasks, especially uh, gait or in, in the more active uh, uh, patient group, the running, because it's very important to see how the alignment of the pelvis is. So uh, when we walk, if imagine my hands would be now the pelvis, so when we walk, uh, it's a normal movement, small movement of the pelvis uh, in the frontal plane, so when we look from the, from the, from the front. However, sometimes we see a, a significant pelvic drop, so the pelvis is not stable enough, enough due to a weakness in, for instance, the glute muscles. And when you, maybe you can imagine that when the pelvis drops, it might always impact the lumbar spine and can cause uh, lumbar spine problems. So that's from the theory perspective. So we're going now into more of the practical um, um, point of view, and that's why I hand over to to Neil, our lead uh, chiropractor and lead physiotherapist, who will also tell you from a chiropractor perspective and, and discuss the function and show you some assessments and self-tests you can do at home and to see where you stand in terms of back pain. Neil. Thank you, Dr. Kunz, and hello, everyone. So before we begin, before I show you some of the tests, I want to, I think some of you have seen these, seen the spine. So this is the lumbar spine, this is the front, this is the knobbly bits we feel running down our spine. This is your joints. This is your spinal cord. So the brain and the spinal cord, they form the central nervous system, which controls everything in the body. Now, if you've got an injury, the nerves, the brain, the body will tell you to tighten up. It's a normal mechanism. It's trying to protect you. That's a really important part of the healing process. Now, this red little donut, think of it like a strawberry jam donut. If you put enough pressure on it, it's weaker at the back, so we can see it squirting out. And when it bulges, presses on a nerve across here, that's when we can get typically sciatica pain. That means leg pain that shoots all the way down. Sometimes it can be pins and needles, numbness, tingling, electrical, or sharp shooting. So that's really important to let us know if you're experiencing these types of pains. But how do we know? Like, what can we do ourselves to find out, is it a muscle, is it a joint, or is it a nerve? Because often it's quite confused. And with our patients, often they're coming in to see us because they're feeling they've got a muscle problem, but actually they're getting shooting pains or pain into the hamstring. So let me show you a very simple test that you can do at home to find out what the problem is. So the first test you can do is you're just walking on your tiptoes 
and you're walking on your heels. Now, if there is a problem with your back, so a disc herniation or a nerve pain, often when you're walking, the foot will just collapse. That not, that's not necessarily a foot problem, but it's often the disc bulge is happening in your back and it's pressing on your nerves. Now, another simple test you can do in standing is to keep your feet together and keep your feet together, keep your legs together, and you're touching the floor. So as far as you can go, but as soon as you feel the pain, please stop. But please be careful if you do these tests at home. Often if you get shooting pain down into the leg, that's another indication of a disc problem or a nerve injury. And then you can arch backwards, just like this, you can put your hands across. Now, if you're getting symptoms right across down here on the back, and the muscles can often go into spasms, that can mean there is a disc or a joint issue across just down here. Now we're gonna bend to the side and I'm going to bend to the other side. Now this is testing whether the muscles on this side or the muscles on this side is provoking your pain. So that's how we often find out. Is it a joint problem? Is it a nerve problem? Or is it a muscular problem? And I want to show you another test that you can do, but please be careful as you do this at home. You put your hand back of your hamstring, the back of your thigh, and you just run it down. If you are experiencing any sharp or dull aches, that's an indication, again, joints are being irritated. So there can be some underlying inflammation. So please be careful when you do this at home. Now, the next test you do is you can get a simple, step. of course, if you've got shorts on, that would be great. And you just get a little soft tissue and you're just stroking down into your legs. So we're checking different places of different nerves go to different areas of the body. So what we're identifying is which area, which nerve is being affected in your spine. So if you're feeling numbness, so you go down in the chin, down into the outer foot, inside foot, into the inner chin. If you are experiencing any dull aches or, sorry, any reduced sensations or any tingling sensation, that again, it's an indication of a nerve problem. Another test you can do is you lift your knees up to the sky, you can straighten up your leg, if you want to, you can put a little bit of resistance from your other leg and to push against it. That's indicating the nerve that's coming from your low back traveling down into your knee. Then you can do is you bring your heels up and if you want to, you can push against your hand and then you bring your big toe up and you push against your big toe and then onto your tiptoes and try to pull your foot upwards. This is all indicating a disc bulge. So going to if you've got any weakness happening, please let us know because that can indicate there's a little bulge happening and pressing on your nerves. Now, when you lie down onto your back, when you straighten up your leg, some of you may have amazing flexibility bringing the leg all the way up, but what we're looking for is, are you getting shooting pain down into the legs? Are you getting pins and needles and numbness? That's indicating the disc or the nerves being irritated. And um, if you can go all the way up, right at the right end, if you're getting pain then, it's describing pain that's coming from your joints typically. Another test for your joint is to make a figure four sign like this. If you're getting local back pain, again, that can indicate that you've got muscle spasms or your joints have become irritated. The final test I want to show to you is you lie down on your front, just like this, keeping your legs straight as possible and you're raising your leg up. Now in this point is we're looking at the joints in your spine. When they become compressed or tightened to each other, that will cause inflammation or irritation inside your muscles. So that's an indicator of muscle or a joint pain. Now inside the facility, what we tend to do is we want to find out where exactly is the pain coming from? Is it from here? Is it from here? Is it from here? Is it a nerve that's causing problem or is it a trigger point? So the connective tissue, the fascia, the muscles itself, often when you press on the area, it can cause again a shooting pain. So it's often a mimicking type of pain. This is why when we do the assessments, we ask you specific questions like, are you getting sharp pain? Are you getting burning pain? Are you getting a dull ache? So that's how we can identify 
what's the problem? Is it muscle? Is it joint? Is it nerve? Or typically it's often combination because the, body, the nerves control everything in your body. If you've got an injury, the nerves will tell the, the muscles and the joints, it's tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. It's just trying to protect you. So spasms is a good thing for your body. I know it causes a lot of sharp pain, but it's actually a protective mechanism. Thank you, Dr. Gins. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Neil. And I think it it was clear that um, uh, it's 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 um, you have options to test yourself at home, and uh, to highlight again, it's always very important to uh, the differentiate between local pain and also pain in the leg, and it's and then it's very important in terms of emergency, non-emergency, to really understand if there is a weakness in the in the muscle or a complete numbness or again, urinary or bowel incontinence. These are emergencies that needs to be solved immediately. Uh, and all the other things we can also solve in many cases through online and, and video consultations. Uh, having said that, now I would like to invite you uh, for some practical tips and some, some exercises. And, uh, and normally, probably you don't see a doctor showing exercises, but uh, again, due to my, my own history, uh, I, I like to do what I preach, so I think to be authentic is, is very important. So the first thing, I mean, please uh, take in consideration what I have said before. So the function is of the spine to move, uh, to allow us to move in all three planes, meaning whenever you exercise and whenever you do something, even on the chair, even between uh, two hours of, uh, of uh, home, homework um, and office or home office, so that you integrate exercises which are, uh, which are in the three planes. So to start with, and I mean, please be aware, you should not have pain and experience pain. And if you experience pain now during the exercise I'm showing, please stop it. But if you are, if you are okay, then it would be uh, good to follow me if you want. So the first thing, usually we, we are hanging more and there's a back support. So we're hanging more and then we're typing and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of compression on the spine, and when it's round, there is compression on the on the on the disc, and the, and there can be also compression on the facet joints. So the first thing what we should do is always try to really lift, try to really elongate our spine. We can do that, and in in terms of that, we're lifting our chest bone and really try. To, to, to lengthen also the double S curve. So we try to reduce the cervical lordosis, we try to reduce the lumbar lordosis, and uh, we also try to reduce the thoracic spine kyphosis. And that way, we really try to elongate the spine and really make the spine as long as possible. And when we do that, we really experience some sort of muscle use we have never used before. And even that is very important to do it once in a while when we're sitting very long. Okay, and then we relax it. And then you can support yourself when you interlace your fingers and then you put your hands behind the head. There is a small prominent bone, which is part of the so-called occiput. So where you can bring your fingers under and then you can help yourself to lift the spine as much as possible. Please don't avoid to lift your shoulders like this. So rather take your elbows more to the inside, push your shoulders down, and then really try to help yourself to elongate the spine. And then you can even actually move a bit from the left to the right and try really to become longer and longer while you extending the spine. Okay, and when you really do that, you feel some muscles and it feels, wow, we, we're working in, the, in a way which is a positive um, for, this, for the spine. So when we, once we do that, we can combine then the extension exercise. So we look up to the ceiling, we try to extend it, and then we look down, and that is the flexion of the spine. We slowly try to uh, flex the spine and do a and flexion of the whole spine. So that stretches the muscles and you look down in order to get a stretch also on the cervical spine. From this point, we slowly, slowly, vertebra by vertebra, come up into a neutral position and then we go again 
I know you can see, unfortunately, yes, there is sweat, so it's exercising, that's good. Okay, so you look up, okay, elongate the spine, and then you curl your pelvis, you make your spine round, okay, and then become round and stretch. If you are able now also to activate your abdominal muscles in a flex position, as well as in the extension position, that would be very useful because that stimulates the core muscle. So we can do it up, and then we can do it down, and we do up and down, and one more time, up, really elongate, and then down, curl the spine, and come to a neutral position. So that's extension flexion. That took me now a minute, so we can do that. And to be honest, I do it uh, once in a while during the day in order to give my spine the stimulus. So we talked about 3D in all three planes. So then it's rotation. So we can then elongate the spine. Always think from your chest bone really to bring your spine up and then rotate. Rotate to the right and then rotate to the left. So that's rotation. Please be very cautious. So whenever you have not experienced any rotation in your spine, that can be sometimes a bit tricky. And it's always important that you really try to, with every twist you make, you try to elongate the spine. Every time you want to elongate, you want to become longer, you want to go to the roof, and that's what your goal is. So you really elongate the spine. So we do it one more time to the right, and then one more time to the left, and then we come to the middle. So what's missing when we have three planes, it's the frontal plane, so it's the it's the side bending, so we can go and then we lift our spine up. It's always that we again elongate the spine. And from this position, yes, you go into a side bend and you can also use your arm to really become here a stretch or get a stretch. And the point is that you always think from your chest bone, go up in order really to elongate the spine also in side bending. And that's what we can do on the other side. So, and we do it one more here, one more to the other side, and then lastly to this side and to the other side. Okay, now I'm talking, but actually if you can continue and can use your breathing, that would be also quite beneficial. So whenever you lift up, you breathe out, and then you can breathe in. That also stimulates the muscle and is also stimulating the diaphragma. And finally, then we can combine the exercise or the movement in terms of we elongate the spine, we extend the spine going forward until we cannot hold the extension anymore, and then we curl it back, so we look down, and then vertebra by vertebra we come up. So, and again, so we elongate the spine, we bring the extended spine to the front, so we flex our hip, and then we curl it back, vertebra by vertebra. Please, please be, be cautious and careful with yourself. Do it slowly. One more time. So extend, come to the front in extended position, and then curl it back, vertebra by vertebra. Really look down so you have a stretch also in the cervical spine. And here we go. So if you do this, Quickly, it takes you two minutes. It's very easy, pop, 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 extension, flexion, rotation, side bending. So that's everyone, we, I know we're super busy. Uh, so that's, everyone can do that. And then when we continue, two more exercises. Uh, sorry, I use the chair now. Uh, so we do a hamstring stretch, which is quite useful because we're always sitting and then we put our legs and, or the lower limb and, and under the chair, so this shortens the hamstrings. So it's very important that we also uh, get a stretch for the hamstrings. You can do it from the chair, so, but you can see me here better. So it's important that you activate the quadriceps, the muscle here, and then with a straight uh, spine, you move forward in order to get a stretch here on the left side here in my case. So I'm going down and I'm going forward, get the stretch back, forward, get the stretch and release. And then I change side. Okay, usually, of course, you do it on the floor, but in order to, that you can see it better, I have, it, I have my foot here on the, on the chair. So again, go forward, activating really the quadriceps. That's very important. Come back, 
go forward, get the stretch, breathe out if you want, and come back, and one more time, and stretch, okay? And finally, uh, it's also the, the hip flexors are very tight because we're sitting all the time and it's, it's hours and hours and typing and typing, especially now in Corona times. That's why, let's not forget the hip flexors. Hip flexors, we can easily stretch it so you bring your leg back, okay? Activate the glutes, contract also the abdominal muscle and then try really to stretch here the uh, hip flexors and you go down and you're going into a flexion, uh, in, into a um, stretch for the hip flexors and again and one more time here we go change side okay we bring the right or the other leg to the back activating the glutes contracting the abdominal muscles and then extend and release and extend and release and extend and release so and that's these are exercises if you do it in a row and uh, and um, as a sequence and um, it's it's done in three four five minutes and if there is more neck problems it's always important also to mobilize the shoulders you can go to the front up back and then of course you can do the side stretches for the cervical spine so that's in brief a couple of exercises which you can easily do in between it's a question how much time you have you want to do it every other hour you want to do it uh, every, every hour or, or more uh, that is something you decide but uh, if you do that especially when you know you have to sit the whole day uh, and it, your your spine would be would be very happy so and then uh, I hand over to Neil because Neil will tell you now how to set up the workspace and what you can do from also practical tips. Thank you, Dr. Kunz. So this simple, you can write this down if you want to, simple eight steps for your home office setup. I've kept my shoes off for a purpose so that you can see my feet. They sh everything should be at 90 degrees. So your ankles to the floor should be at 90 degrees and your knees should also be at 90 degrees. So everything should be level. The reason it's 90 degrees is because it doesn't put too much strain on your, not just your knees, not just your hips, but also your low back. And then it comes on to our hips and our low back. The hips should be at maximum 90 degrees. Often you can get like a wedge cushion that you can sit underneath that will just increase the space for the hips here. Now that provides a space for the hips to breathe and also protects your low back. So that's quite useful. It's just called a wedge cushion. That's not a problem. But if you don't have one, keep the hips at 90, 90 degrees, no more than that. And then our elbows and our wrists. So as we're typing, it's often we can, we tend to move forwards in our elbows or our wrists. We tend to do this. So our hands and our, and our wrists are tend to be in different angles. So keep your hands, your elbows tucked underneath and keep it at 90 degrees. With your shoulders, make sure you bring your shoulders down and back. So don't worry about bringing it. Often people do this, go so up and backwards, but make sure you bring it down and back. That activates your muscles right between your shoulder blades. And that's the ones that can often get fatigued. And when they get fatigued, they can lead to mid-back pain and that stiffness and that cracking sensation. Your wrists, when you're typing, I know sometimes we're reading textbooks or messages, our wrists can be in different positions, but try and keep them as straight as possible. That's to prevent any wrist strains from developing and any finger strains as well. When you're at the computer and often on, if you're on the laptop, it's very difficult to bring the eye levels in contact with the same framework as your top of the screen. So build it up with yellow pages or textbooks, build it up your laptop so you, to make sure your eyes are level with the top of the screen. Now, on the seventh point, and what I want to make sure is you have a break on a regular basis. The reason is your ligaments, your soft tissues, share what we call a visco, which means a thick and elastic properties, which means they feel like a rubber band. And after 20 minutes, your ligaments, your muscles, they become strained and they can become sprained as well. And it takes 
it depends on how long you sit. If you sit for 20 minutes, it can take an hour or so before you come back to normal levels. But if you're sitting there for, let's say, six hours at a time, if you're at the home in the office working from eight till four or eight till six or whatever it be, that can take up to four to eight hours to recover. And that's often you describe as when you say to your colleagues or to your family, like, I've still got this niggling back issues. That's because the back, the joints, the disc, the muscles have all become irritated. So it's important also in the desk, there's a myth that you sh we should be sitting nice in a rigid posture, but actually we do move around in different positions in the chair. That's to help loosen up your muscles, get the joints moving, get the fluid between your muscle fibers, get them all nice and watery-like. Often when we wake up in the morning, our muscles are a bit like a diesel, like a diesel fuel. It's quite thick and it's quite viscous. But as we keep moving within a few minutes, it becomes, okay, I feel nice and loose. So that's the same concept as when you're sitting down. If you sit down for too long, everything stiffens up. So keep moving and do follow the exercises Dr. Kuntz showed you, because it's important to keep your, not just your joints healthy, but also keeping your discs and your nerves as healthy as possible. Thank you, Dr. Kuntz. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's from our side. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. I saw already that there are coming some questions um, and we are more than happy to answer uh, these questions. Um, the first question, uh, would a standing desk be beneficial for your back or would standing all day lead to further problems? Um, that's um, actually exactly what, what Neil just tried to, tried to uh, explain. So the, the most important thing is, is actually the dynamic. Um, if, you, if you are in one position for a longer period of time, that's not useful uh, and not beneficial for the spine. So when this comes to sitting or even standing, um, it's not advisable to, to, to bring your spine for a long period of time in the, in the same position. So a standing desk is quite useful to integrate it uh, in a, in also in a seating area. So um, to, to stand and sit and stand and, and sit, so, so to have a, have a change in that. But also standing long time uh, is, is also not beneficial. So if you have to stand, whatever, in, in, a, in a church, for instance, I remember myself standing in the church for, for three hours. So that can cause a lot of back pain. So that's also very useful when you have to stand just to move your spine a little bit, slightly back to the front bend it a bit, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the home office, um, a standing desk alone um, is, is not probably not the right, the, the best solution, it will help. So the, the dynamic between sitting and standing, that would be the best um, answer. Um, Neil, there's a question, there's probably that's for you, but good to answer. So what do you think of the Theragun for shoulder and back pain? This is a very good question, actually, because I get this question quite a lot. And Theragun, it's, I mean, you can hit every single muscle, let's just pick on the arm or the back. You, you can treat everywhere, but unless you get specific in which muscle groups that's affecting you. So is it coming from the, exactly in the mid-back? Is it coming from the side of the muscles? If you try to treat everything, what can happen is your joints can get into further spasms. But I would say start with a lighter setting first, and just go nice and gentle, not more than about five minutes. And, but do not push too hard with the Theragun because it is quite rapid. And try not to be a pinpoint in one position. Move it around in different positions. Ideally get someone else to do this for you. But again, the Theragun is not going to be a quick fix solution to the problem. It's you need to have a look at what's exactly the problem. Is it coming from your joints? Is it coming from your muscles? Is it coming from your nerves? So unless you find out what the problem is, I mean, if it's a generally, okay, I'm sitting in the office for a long period of time and I've just got a tightness inside my back, okay, Theragun will be nice, good relief for your muscles. But is it going to help with the disc and the joint that's been irritated? Probably not, but it will calm down the muscles. So do it, but do it, be cautious, don't overdo it. That's often the problem when I see patients. They're doing it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes at a time and three times, four times a day, which can lead to even further spasms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question uh, which I read. So there is a, a, a chronic muscle spasm uh, um, for last or last 19 years due to a boat accident. Uh, the MRI didn't show any disc injury. 
the person never found a long-term relief despite regular physio whenever the spasm occurred, which is every few months. So what is the long-term solution? Um, so when there is an accident in, in general, so it's always um, important in the beginning to exclude structural problems such as a fracture or a disc problem. But in your case, it seems to be that this is excluded. Uh, we see in many, in many cases then when the MRI is negative or we don't find the clear solution, the solution uh, then there is a problem in the function. And a shock like an accident, a shock on the spine, can lead that the that the uh, that the spine has lost some some sort of, of of function. So imagine there's a high impact on the spine, and then it's it's kind of shock for the whole system and and for the whole tissue. And it can be that there is a restriction now in the range of motion in the facet joints, and that can cause stiffness and can cause a tightness in the in the paravertebral muscles, which then can cause the spasm. So um, it's it's I mean. First of all, of course, we have to do a proper clinical examination, but I am, I'm assuming from the questionnaire that most likely there is a functional problem in terms of range of motion. Maybe there's also a, a problem in terms of, um, of, of strength and posture, so we can assess that and we can find the best uh, personalized solution for that. Um, Neil, um, a question for you. What are some of the causes of a pain-free and mobile tucked pelvis? What are the causes of the pain-free and mobile tucked pelvis? So, do you mean a tucked pelvis? I'm presuming you mean the pelvis that's in this position, I'm assuming. And so simple thing is, as Dr. Kins has described the exercise, just keep the hips moving when you're sitting down and keep the hips moving. Make sure you do the cat camel type of stretches. Open up your mid-back. Look, I mean, in terms of the spine, the neck, the mid-back, and the low back, there's no such thing as this area, this area, this area. The body doesn't know this. It works as one complete system, which is why the exercises, as Dr. Kins showed you, stretch out your mid-back, stretch out your low back, stretch out your neck. That's really important because they all play a part. Um, together, your muscles are running from your low back and going all the way up to your neck. And it doesn't know that, okay, it's, this is the low back, this is the mid back, this is the neck area. It doesn't know how to differentiate. So keep the hips moving, but in, if you're sitting down, rotate the hips round in circles, go in opposite directions as well. Tilt your pelvis forwards, tilt your pelvis backwards. And every 20 minutes, I can't emphasize this enough, but every 20 minutes, please do take breaks. Even if it means you just stand up and then do the exercises. So as Dr. Kunz described, do the stretches in standing up position, stretch your hamstrings out every 20 minutes. It's really important you do have a break. I don't mean leaving your desk for the next 30 minutes, but it can be for a minute or so just to do the exercises and come through. That can really help out with pain relief and also to prevent and uh, minimize the risks of further damage from sitting down. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Neil. I have two more questions with regards to an, to an, uh, the exercise ball to use it, um, and uh, and also um, if if it would be better to use it instead of the chair. I mean, the exercise ball. Um, it is um, when we talk about dynamic sitting, the exercise ball definitely helps. But the exercise ball normally only the exercise ball has no back support. So if you're not used to it, uh, you will you will get some problems if you use it from day one ongoing for the whole day. So um, again, it, it can be beneficial, especially uh, when you constantly then move the pelvis a bit to so be dynamic, um, but uh, only to use an exercise ball without a back support where you can sometimes really relax and hang, which is also allowed and possible. Um, it's, I would advise against it completely. Um, so that's the question with regards to the exercise ball and uh, there is another question maybe for you and um, neil what do you think about the foam roller fascia release for this quarantine period another really good question as well so foam roller um, there's different areas you can apply the foam roller to your mid back to your low back to your legs coming through now typically you can get injured from doing a foam roller release by yourself because i'll do this on the bed so just to show you 
I hope you can see that. So when you're lying down, if you're releasing the side muscles coming through here, just make sure you're squeezing the stomach muscles, protecting the spine as much as you can, and then rolling yourself nice and forwards. There's no such thing as, I know the concept is no pain, no gain, but there's no such thing as no pain, no gain. If the body tells you this, there's a pain, please respond to this and take the pressure off. So you just come through, keep your spine nice and straight, bend your leg over. You can use your hands to protect yourself and roll over back and forth your side muscles on your thigh. When it comes to the low back, what you can do is put it horizontal. And in that horizontal position, you can put your hands behind your back and nice and slowly just rolling back and forth, nice and slowly. But again, it shouldn't be the point where you're trying to get a crack or a pop or a release. It should be nice and gentle. So you can do this, but please, please be careful because it's, it can cause quite acute spasms. So, so if you're dealing this for pain relief or for, because you've got a back injury and nerve pain, please be careful with doing this because it can lead to even further problems. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if we have time for more questions, but there's one question. I'm suffering from neck and shoulder pain or mid-back pain and any suggestions in terms of um, exercise, uh, please. So the, it's always the question, okay, what's the diagnosis? Is it more the neck which causes the problem? So it could be a disc or a faster joint problem, for instance, or is it more the neck, the neck muscles? which I have to try to uh, describe before in terms of activating it all the time when we sit, or is it really the shoulder joint? So in order to differentiate that, uh, it's, it's also we can move our head back and forth and rotate and to see if that causes directly problem. And then uh, on the other hand side, we can also move our arm and can lift it up to 90 degree bend then the elbow and then do an external and internal rotation. And then we can see if that causes pain here in the shoulder. So that way we can um, differentiate uh, also at home in a self-assessment, is it more the, the cervical spine, is it more the neck or is it more the shoulder? And, uh, and that leads to different um, exercise prescription. In terms of the neck, of course, we can do a lot of stretching, which helps especially during this time um, uh, for the for the for the trapezius muscle as well as for the cervical spine muscle, and in terms of if there is really an impingement and inflammation under the roof of the shoulder, please do not force yourself to go into this range where it causes you pain because then it can aggravate, and and that's not advisable. So in these cases, if it's really the shoulder, then do simple exercise like like uh, using the arm. And, and moving it back to the front, do simple circles. And then if you can do a bit more a 30, 40 degree abduction, you can do circles here with the arm, but don't force it, don't go into the, the pain. Um, so that's what you can do when it comes to really shoulder pain. Um, and finally, and I think that is something, uh, it's not the topic for today. We can do another chat if you want. So it's, uh, it's what are the best exercises for decreasing flat foot? And if left untreated, can flat foot be harmful? Um, that is something actually we, can, we need to classify the, the flat foot. Um, is it more a functional flat foot or is it the rigid one? So uh, the rigid one, so we only can do that with imaging and, and a proper clinical examination. So the rigid ones, when there is a severe problem, and it causes pain, uh, surgical options are, are, are there. But most of the time, it's a, it's a flexible flat foot, and that's related to the posture in the foot, so the arch in the foot, and that is related to the soft tissue, which are the muscles and the fascia as well. So what can you do in terms of exercising? Um, and new research showed that the toe flexors are very, very important. So the muscles under the under the foot so and these muscles you can train usually um we 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 tend to uh, to show patients that they can train and grabbing um whatever a pen or something and just to to move the toe flexors however it shows that this stimulus is definitely not enough so what you can do for instance you can use a use a theraband or something and bind it around the the, um, the, 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 toe, the toes and then against high resistance try to really flex and use the toe flexes so that you really can do uh, 8, 10, maximum 12 repetitions so then the stimulus is, is really enough 
to, to make the muscles, the toe flexors grow. And finally, when it comes to flat foot, we should integrate our um, um, calf muscles, which is the triceps duro and the uh, posterior muscle, tibialis posterior muscle. These are also very important. So heel raises in order to activate the muscles to, to work on the flat foot. But again, this is a different topic. It's not the spine. And we are more than happy to discuss that uh, further in another talk. Or uh, if you need any medical advice, you can always uh, contact us. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kuntz and Dr. Aguera. That was hugely insightful. Um, it was interesting to see what we can learn about our bodies in the spine movement lab um, at Lanzerhof at the Arts Club. Um, and then how we can identify joint, nerve, muscle or disc pain by those, um, those tests uh, that Dr. Neil demonstrated for us at home. And then um, some, some stretches and exercises by Dr. Kuntz and then you know, the ergonomics home office checklist um, was, was really interesting too. Um, as Dr. Kuntz said, um, if, if anyone has got further questions or we weren't able to answer today your needs, then um, do get in touch at lanzerhoff at theartsclub.co.uk um, and if you would like to inquire about video consultation um, or speak to one of the doctors. So thank you again um, and uh, wishing everyone a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.